Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of the Culture Clash here on the Fandom Podcast Network. You are either listening to this on podcast versions from our FP Net feed, or you're on our YouTube channel as we are trying for the new year, our New Year's resolution to get more video content onto the YouTube channel for the Fandom Podcast Network. And this is the first Culture Clash of the new year. And you know what? It's only appropriate. We do Culture Clash. And welcome, Kevin Reitzel. What up? Good to be back. Good to be back. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Even yeah. though we're like a couple of weeks in, but you know, sp- since the last culture clash, you know. Well, first of all, Happy New Year to you and to all the listeners out there. If Kevin's sounding a little froggy, he had a pretty big Raider nerd adventure here here that <laughs> helped him lose his voice. So he might his his voice might sound a little froggy in and out. I think he's popping some uh, throat lozenges as we go, so you might hear that a little bit. But Kevin, what what were you up to? Because it ties into <laughs> something else we want to talk about. Yeah, I was uh, in Las Vegas to see the final home game for the Las my Las Vegas Raiders against the uh, LA Chargers. And uh, for you uh, football and sports fans, it was on Sunday night prime time, and uh, was probably one of the most exciting football games in a long, long time. And my uh, beloved Raiders was able to pull it off in overtime, last second field goal, and win. And I was screaming my throat off, so to speak. <laughs> so, in other words, you got a late Christmas present, is what what you're saying? Yes, yes. Uh, got to. Fu- it's it's funny too. I. <laughs> I went to two Raider home games this year. I went to the first one against Baltimore and that went to overtime and I go to the last game against, uh, you know, the LA chargers and it went overtime and they both won. So I'm doing pretty good for overtime games in person. So that's good. (laughs) Oh, and let's not forget when you came down here a few years ago to visit me in Tampa, we went to the Tampa game and that went into about as long of overtime as, the game the other night. That's right. It was a the Raiders Tampa game, and that one went into overtime too, didn't it? Yeah, it, yeah and you, we yeah. were all dying in the heat and came out yeah. a little. God, it was red, so hot. Red, worse right. for red. Yeah, <laughs> so. but I had a great time in Vegas. It was a lot of fun. But yeah, my voice still hasn't quite recovered. Yeah, but we got some great topics for this week's show. We got to pay some tributes to some people. We got Let's News. We got some Buy It, Stream It, or and See It. And the Magic Eight Ball has got a very fun and interesting question for us this week. So without further ado. Let's do this thing. This is the Culture Clash. back and you know what over the holidays it was, a, it was a tough it was a tough holiday season in certain aspects kevin as we lost some major icons over the holidays and right, right after the first of the year i don't want to necessarily start to show on the downer but these were some pretty major people and people who at least for people like you and me kevin we grew up with with these people as a heavy aspect of our entertainment lives or our sports lives in one one case. So I want to just take a little bit of time and remember some of the people we lost. And first and foremost, I think Kevin, the biggest, maybe the biggest impact on you and me was John Madden. Yeah. One of the biggest sports icons of all time, especially when it comes to football itself, you know, legendary football coach with my Oakland Raiders at the time and brought them a Super Bowl in 77 and then went on to a fantastic broadcasting career uh, and kind of set the gold standard with that and then started probably one of the biggest football games of all time and also was able to bring in a lot of fans into learning about football and becoming a football fan and being in Las Vegas uh, at this uh, game this last weekend, this last this home game against um, the Chargers, uh, the Raiders did a great job in honoring him. Uh, they had his original uh, Madden bus there that you could uh, go in and tour and take pictures with and around. They also had a really nice, uh, these little walls kind of set up that were, uh, that were movable that I think they'll display somewhere permanently that you can write, um, you know, your personal thoughts and thanking John Madden and stuff. And then uh, at the beginning of the game, the Raiders have a um, every home game, they have a tradition of um, lighting the big Al Davis torch and they had uh, Virginia Madden and, and um, you know, the wife of the late John Madden along with their family 
uh, light the torch in honor of John Madden, but also she honored Al Davis at the same time. Yeah, I, I know for me, it's, it's it's very interesting when you talk about the career of Madden because, he, you know, for a long time, people only knew him as a coach. Then there was a whole generation that only knew him as a broadcaster and went like he was an NFL coach. And now we have a whole generation that doesn't even know him as a broadcaster. We just they just know him as the guy from the video game. Right. And, yeah. I mean, I mean, he's timeless. And Kevin, I before before we move on, on this, I got to ask you, what what was your first edition of Madden? I'm I'm curious. Do you remember what your first edition of the Madden game was? Um, I re okay. I'll be honest with you. I never played the game regularly. I never actually owned my own copy. Uh, sports games were not my thing. I enjoyed sports, but I remember the first covers of him on it was a big deal, and I remember friends of mine um, that did. But uh, I was more into like you know action adventure first person shooter type games that was my thing when it came to sports the only sports game i think i remember playing to death was blades of steel if i remember correctly mm -hmm. on yeah, nintendo, for me, nintendo. Yep. yeah uh but i was more when it came to video games i was a, i was more of a non-sports guy but uh, i had lots of friends that got into it but uh, i it's funny i i was i was going to turn the question back to you because a lot of people will say i started playing madden when this person was on the cover so kyle let me turn it back to you what about you i am old old school madden the first version of madden i ever played the, the first year madden came out it was a pc only game and i didn't have a pc <laughs> living in alaska the next year it was a special order for the sega genesis you couldn't buy wow. it in stores but you had wow. you could order it from ea so i ordered it i think it had 16 of the teams at the time on it and they didn't have the player license yet so it was just the number but i just remember being so blown away by it and i think it was the next year they got the nfl licensing on it right. and so it was it was just a, it was a huge game for me it was one i bought for a long time almost bought every year i think the madden franchise needs a little bit of reinvention to it i think it's kind of gotten a little bit wash rinse repeat shall we say right. but I think the biggest thing with John Madden for me was, I mean, he was the man who taught me football outside of my dad, you know, right. watching John Madden. Cause it was always in the eighties for me that he was always doing the 49ers games, the Cowboys games, the giants games, the Thanksgiving those, games those... were huge. Were huge. Oh, yeah, he, 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 yeah. He was turducken. Yeah. The, 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 that Turkey. And uh, it was a Thanksgiving tradition. If you didn't see Madden, you know, or when you saw Madden. Yeah. Um, just one other note on Madden too. I, it, I don't know how it felt to you, Kevin, but it just felt very strange to have him pass just a few days after that wonderful documentary that Fox did for him on aired. Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and if you haven't seen this and you're a sports fan, you need to watch this. It's on air constantly. You can find it on demand. It's yeah. a phenomenal documentary. Madden looked in wonderful health. He didn't look bad at all. So, and I, I think they said it was rather shocking of his passing, but yeah. definitely a legend for sports and a man who definitely became bigger than just being a sports broadcaster. Yeah, we got notification of his death literally like I think three days after that aired on Christmas because Christmas was on a Saturday and I think we found on Monday maybe. Maybe it was two days. Yeah. yeah. So oh. rest in peace, John. Well when we talk sports too, we always mention a, a word that's taken place as the GOAT, the greatest of all time. Well, in my opinion, the true greatest of all time passed away just a few weeks before her 100th birthday. That is the in just endearing cultural icon, Betty White, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, I, you know, what a legend and so, so funny willing to not willing to give a, give a crap and just her, be her. And of course, most people will remember her from the Golden Girls, but uh, her uh, legacy goes way back, way back. But uh, and, and then she's made so many iconic film roles as well. Yeah. Um. For me, I mean, obviously, the Golden Girls, I think, is where she, in as a cultural lexicon, in the cultural lexicon, that's where she really boomed. And then doing such things that were just so outrageous and shocking. One of the best, one of my favorite performances of hers is Lake Placid. I loved her in Lake Placid <laughs> just because it was so out there, but she loved doing those kind of things. And I, we were counting down to her hundredth birthday, which would have been in just a few days from the time we're recording this and she passed away. But that's, that was Betty White. She was going to go, she's 
she when she was going to go, she was going to go on her terms and not yeah. anybody else's. So yeah, yeah, yeah. What a legend. Uh, speaking of legends, another legend passed away uh, just a few days ago. They call me Mr. Tibbs, Sidney Portier. Um, Kevin, I'm a huge fan of his. I loved um, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, and of course, the heat in the heat of the night is phenomenal. Yeah, uh, and he, he he also had a couple more recent movies. He's been him retired for a while, but he did that movie. What was it? Was it Hard Hard to Kill with Tom Shoot Berger? to Kill with Clancy Brown? Kill. Yeah, that was, was the it? yeah. I remember him in his earlier stuff, but this was a film that really stood out for me because he was really good as a hard nosed. I think it was FBI guy uh, trying to chase a uh, uh, a serial killer uh, that was disguising himself, and Clancy Brown was in that. Um, and it was just it was a really good thriller, of course, uh, known elsewhere as Deadly Pursuit. If you ask uh, Aaron there in Australia. Uh, which actually makes more sense, but uh, we called it shoot to kill. Tom Berenger was in that as well with Kirstie Alley. Great one. But also uh, in a uh, little Nikita where um, a young river Phoenix uh, is playing is in a family. If I remember correctly, that was uh, a sleeper American family that were Soviet sleeper agents. And uh, I remember him in that. And of course uh, he was in that all-star cast sneakers, which is a film that I need to revisit because I forget how many people were in that. What a legend. Oh, that, that was a phenomenal cast, but yeah, a pure legend, um, pure class act, um, very much a man who broke a lot of racial barriers in his <laughs> age, too. So his last, um, by the way, his last IMDb credit was a TV movie called The Last Brickmaker in America, where he played Henry Cobb. That was in 2001. That's his last as an actor. Yeah, I knew he had been retired for a while. And then we've got one more person we want to honor. And Kevin, this one came as a total shock. I got actually word of it through my local news because he was he passed away while he was here in or in Orlando, just a couple an hour and a half or so away from me. Um, a lot of people consider him America's dad, and that's Bob Saget. Yeah. And you know, obviously, I think for a whole generation, he is America's dad. He was d being Danny Tanner on Full House. But a lot of people forgot, and it, it really didn't come to light till probably the last maybe decade or so, his stand-up and just how hardcore his stand-up was. <laughs> he could speak dirty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, the thing that I really began to understand soon after his death was how it affected the, his fellow comedians. I saw so many wonderful tributes and just, you know... Um, you know, rest in peace and s stories of Bob Saget's uh, peers. And, uh, you know, whether, you know, whether it's Jimmy Kimmel or all these other late night people and stuff like that, and how many of them had came forward and realized, you know, what a great guy he was and what a funny guy he was. Um, and this is this other side of him where most people knew him as, you know, is, is Mr. Tanner in, in the full house, you know? I remember he did a turn on Entourage one of the seasons, and he was yes. pulling that full <laughs> filthy act going yes. on. It was absolutely <laughs> hilarious. Um, not only the com comedy community, though. I mean, just actors and people all over were just paying tribute to him, talking about how he, they wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. Um, forgive me, I can't remember his name. He was the lead on How I Met Your Mother. And he talked about the special bond he had with Bob Saget because he was, you know, if you remember when How I Met Your Mother first started, Bob Saget was the father telling the story. Right. That's right. Yeah, he was the the voice. Yeah. So um, just some great legends, and the world is a little less without them in it. So I just want to take a minute to thank each and every one of them for giving me a lot of entertainment in my lifetime. Yeah. Rest so. in peace. Now, Kevin, I know the voice is a little rocky, but do you have, do you have enough in us to get us there? I do not. <laughs> okay, well watch then. it without me. <laughs> okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, let's news. Let's news. My voice back. I can't uh, let it go. I'm. Besides tomorrow's the Raiders playoff game, I gotta save a little bit for that. <laughs> are you I gotta ask, are you going anywhere to watch the game or are you kind of chilling at home? I'm probably gonna chill around here and, and do it. I just I wanna be relaxed and enjoy it that way and stuff. So yeah. So Kevin, as we open up the news, I think I'm a little bit excited because one of my <laughs> all-time favorite TV shows is returning 
back to FX as a, I believe it's a six episode miniseries with the Timothy Oliphant returning. Justified is coming back, Kevin. Raylan Givens returns. Yeah. Uh, I, in excitement for this, I watched the first episode of Justified just like a little while ago, and I'm excited to see him return. Raylan Givens to me is one of the best all time TV characters. And obviously, uh, Walton Goggins is Boyd Crowder in the original run of Justified. I'm, I, from what I understand, the story they're going with is kind of not going to tie into what happened in Justified. It's going to be another story of Raylan Givens, but I, I'm, I'm all for that. I think it looks like it's going to take place in Detroit. And if you watch Justified, mm-hmm. you remember there were some ties to the mafia in Harlan County to Detroit. So yeah, I, I think this is going to be quite I, interesting I had- to see. I don't. I, I'm sure they're not going to like erase anything that happened in Justified. That was the impression I just got from you. I mean, you said they're not going to tie anything. I mean, I, it's just another chapter. He's now moving to Detroit. They're not going to like forget anything that happened in Kentucky. Oh, no, 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 no. They're just. I don't think you're going to see elements. Of, you might see one. You're not going to see like Boy Crowder or Ava or any of those characters right. translate to this show. So okay, there might be a mention of them or or something like that. But I he has excited. a. He, he's going to have a kid that he's going to a teenage kid now that he's going to help raise if i remember correctly so yeah yeah i i cannot wait bring this on speaking of things coming back to kevin one of netflix's biggest things and big if you count the stars that are in it has they've agreed with the rock ryan reynolds and gal gadot not to do one but two more red notice films for netflix which will probably be filmed back to back now kevin we talked a little bit about red notice a few episodes back on buy it stream it and see it and while we weren't overwhelmed blown out of the water by it we did think it was a lot of fun yeah definitely it had a lot of adventure it uh, had kind of a james bond feel uh and you know the, the international intrigue and throwing a good heist and stuff it was it was a fun fun film and you know the stars had great chemistry and I wouldn't mind seeing that again. Yeah. I mean, th- those three, I don't know how the screen handled that much charisma in one scene. <laughs> when the th- yeah, yeah. When the three of them are in it. I, but- I might, I just hope they can keep it fresh, you know, and, and throw in a twist and maybe some more, bring in some more fun characters and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'd like to see who they're going to add into the mix for these uh, next two sequels. But Kevin also returning later this summer, it's, it's actually been set for June 3rd. One of the shows that I know we're both huge fans of and has become a cultural icon show on Amazon, and that is The Boys, set to return June 3rd, uh, season three. Are we ready for this? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, bring it now. I'm ready for it now. I'm ready. I want to see what happens. I mean, we, we are always rather shocked by what we see on The Boys, and we really don't know what to expect. <laughs> and that's good. It keeps us on our toes. And uh, that show did a great job in shocking us. And, uh, you know, just keeping us on the edge. So and it's it's gritty, too. I love how gritty it is. It's going to be interesting for me, for me to watch the season, third season of The Boys now, after the actor who plays Homelander, watching the show you recommended to me, Banshee, where he was the lead <laughs> in that. So yes. I, I'm looking forward to the imp- imp- And I believe, too, this is the season. I, I can't think you of You did finish name. that series, right? Yeah. Oh, I love that series. I, okay, I, I, I will probably rewatch that series more than once. Um, one of the leads from supernatural as part of this upcoming season too i believe i believe was the actor who played dean on supernatural he's going to play like this older hero so it's going to be interesting to see how that goes too and we still are they are still working on that boys spinoff series like something academy where it's about the young heroes in training oh that's right there was a spinoff that was uh yeah okay i forgot about that so i have a question for you kevin yeah if an award if an award show happens, but nobody sees or hears it, were the awards really awarded? That's a good question. Cause it seems like these awards uh, nowadays um, sneak up on me and I'm starting to care less about them right now. Cause they're just weird. <laughs> they, they are very weird. COVID has made that weird. And the golden yeah. globes were especially weird this year because there was this whole boycott thing of the golden globes because of the organization that runs the golden globes. I, from what I heard, there was questions about ethical things they had done and, you know, diversity issues and stuff like that. And the, NBC, diversity, it, diversity was the biggest issue that's been going on for a while now. And uh, it's, it's, ju- it's justified. It's bad. It's been bad. <laughs> Yeah. And ho- most of Hollywood said, we're not going, we're boycotting this year. NBC said, because of that, we're not airing it. But they still had the awards. And the, if nothing else, the Golden Globe always seems like they're the precursor to the Oscars and kind of set the table for what to start looking for. So I just want to get a few of the major categories, Kevin, if you want to bear mm-hmm. with me for a moment. Um, 
Best performance by an actor in a television series, musical, or comedy. I think this was hands down Jason Sudeikis, Ted Lasso. Yeah, Jason Sudeikis, my man. He was so good in that series. Uh, for an actress in a musical or comedy on TV, Gene Smart from the show Hacks. I've heard good things about that. I haven't watched it yet, though. I do want to check it out. Are you on the succession bandwagon, Kevin? Have you I've jumped watched- on that at all? I I wouldn't say bandwagon, but I decided to watch the first few episodes, and I'm intrigued. Um, seeing a a rich family uh, start to kind of tear each other apart when it comes to who's going to control what, I do find fascinating, and I'll probably revisit it. Well, Jeremy Strong won Best Actor in a Television Series Drama for Success in this year. So, And I know it's getting a lot of hype. That's why I asked. The Best Actress in a TV Series Drama was MJ Rodriguez from Pose. I have not watched that, so I'm not sure about that. Um, Best Actor in a Limited Series. I'm going to throw this out. This is for Hold on real quick. Can we, can we go back to the actress in the television drama? Yeah, MJ I don't Rodriguez. know. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't seen Pose. I haven't heard about it, but there's some big names on there that did not win jennifer aniston for the morning show christine baranski for the good fight and elizabeth moss in the handmaid's tale who's been killing it in that so that's a big upset yeah that that is a big upset um motion picture made for television by actor um michael keaton won for the dope sick which i have not seen but it is michael keaton and this you want to talk about a heavy hitting category you had paul bettany oscar isaacs you mcgregor in this category as well kevin you and so. mcgregor in halston you hadn't heard that yeah yeah. Um, Kate Winslet won for best actress in a limited series or drama for TV. Oh, she won for mayor of East town. Jeremy Renner's in that. I need to give that a shot. I've been hearing no. some good stuff about it. Ma- Jeremy Renner's a mayor of East town, which is a paramount plus show. This was an HBO show mayor of East town. M a R E. They're not the same show. No, I think, I think it's mayor of Kingstown that Renner is in mayor of East town is, what it's a totally okay, different I'm, show. I'm I'm confused. <laughs> this shows you how bad this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, the Jeremy Renner one. I want to see that one. There we go. <laughs> yeah, that looks good. And I've actually heard really good things about this mayor. Mayor. Piece, yeah, you're on... right. I think it is mayor. You're right. <laughs> yeah, it's on HBO Max. So, um, okay. best television series drama was Succession. Uh, best miniseries was The Underground Railroad. Um, let's me go ahead. in film like some of the categories in film best picture for musical or comedy west side story i have a sneaking suspicion this could be a big oscar winner down the road people love spielberg about that yeah yeah best motion picture drama the netflix film with benedict cumberbatch the power of the dog i've not seen it it's, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, come, it's a, that come out yet yeah it's it's out it's been out for about a month it, it's a western so I would okay. like to check. Okay. All right. Check that out. Um, I, I, I ask because you know how when you go on and click on a Netflix and it gives you like the top 10 stuff that's like, you know, yeah. hot right now. I don't remember seeing that. It almost went right by me. Okay. Um, best actor in a supporting role in any motion picture, Cody Smith McGee, The Power of the Dog. So you've got that. Best actress in a supporting role in any motion picture, Ariana DeBose for West Side Story. Best hmm. actor in a. Motion picture, musical, or comedy. Andrew Garfield for Tick, Tick, Boom, which is another Netflix thing. Best motion picture animated, Encanto, which won the news Disney film that just came out. I bet you all the pressers that Andrew Garfield was doing for that movie ended up talking about Spider-Man. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he did. Here's the big one, Kevin. Best actor in a motion picture drama, Will Smith for King Richard. Yeah. He plays... Um, the, the Venus and Serena's father uh, yeah. best actress for in a motion picture drama, Nicole Kidman for being the Ricardos, which just came out here recently on Amazon yeah. where she played Lucille ball um, best actress in a motion picture, musical or comedy uh, Rachel Ziegler for West side story. Um, best director was uh, Jane Campion for power of the dog. Do and Dune won best original score. So yeah. those were the golden globes some of the bigger categories just want to talk about that. Like I said, I don't, it's like a tree falling in the um, forest does it do forest and you don't hear it. it. Just, <laughs> it that's kind of how we're f- feeling about award shows right now. It's going to be another weird year. Oscars year. Isn't it going to yeah. be Kevin? Yeah. It's going to be that. Well, let's talk about some movies that we have seen and other things we've seen. Cause we have seen a few things. So once again, it is time to buy it, buy it, Stream it, stream it, stream it.
or unsee it. Now, Kevin, we talked about this greatly with a uh, huge cast of Avengers on our True Believers um, Marvel MCU podcast, but Spider-Man No Way Home, we haven't talked about it on the Culture Clash at all. So do you have some brief thoughts here for Spider-Man No Way Home? What a great way to end the year of Marvel. Um, you know, we had rumors of... Uh, do we need to do a spoiler? Yeah, in fact, you know, before most people's probably going to see this, but we're going to talk about some other things too. So you know what? All right, spoilers. Uh, we heard rumors about the other Spider-Man showing up, and it was great the way they did it. And uh, Matt Murdock, you know, the character showing up as well. Uh, what a I feel like everyone united on this one, and it was really, really cool uh, when it came to fandom. And and we needed something like that to end this year um, with a real blockbuster movie where you have to go to the theater to see it too. Made over a billion dollars already, you know. I mean, it's worldwide, and um, it opened up a, a a big can of Marvel worms when it comes to uh, dealing with the. Uh, um, alternate timelines and stuff like that. So it was just a great time in the theater. I saw it twice and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was absolutely fun and huge hats off to both Marvel studios and Sony for taking elements, all these different elements from all these Spider-Man movies and executing a phenomenal film, because that's not easy. You're taking three different series of films, not just three different films, three different series of films and mixing all the elements together. And they pulled it off pretty much flawlessly and just absolutely amazing performances. Obviously, we've if you are on the Internet, you know, the Andrew Garfield love that has been pouring out since this came out, which is looking like it's going to lead to him being spider-man again in some film at some point here very yeah. soon so um it was just fun and it just goes to show you that um kevin feige marvel and spider-man can say pandemic what pandemic hold our beer <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> so, but kevin we we made a return to a certain universe too right before the holidays in both theaters and on hbo max matrix Re resurrections came out and I think this this has definitely had some mixed reactions across the internet, Kevin. I watched this. I felt one way about it. I think you might have felt a little differently than how I felt on this. But how did you feel about it? I could have lived without it, to be honest with you. Um, while Spider-Man was definitely a buy it, at best, this was a stream it for me. I think that they got a little too meta with it. They got a little too cutesy with it. And I think for, for me too, they took some of the some of the things and just it's like okay, what what can we do to twist the matrix around? But they it didn't feel like they were running on too many fresh original ideas to me. Now I will say I think Jessica Henwick as and in her role in this film was outstanding, and I wish they would have spent more time with her character. I thought Keanu was Keanu. I mean Keanu's always great. I wish they would have done a little bit more with Trinity earlier in the film. I think they waited too long for that. And I got to do give a shout out to Neil Patrick Harris. He was phenomenal in this, in this movie as well. But I just think sometimes they were just kind of making a joke at the fan, at the matrix fans expense a little bit. And it went a little too far, but that's just me personally. Uh, yeah, I, I disagree. I got what they were trying to do. And I liked the fun that they were kind of having with the little twist of how they were going to deal with the matrix. I love the idea of the, the video game aspect of it. And uh, trying to keep Neo um, back in it, in their so-called place in the Matrix. And I love all the little clues that were laid with uh, uh, Neil Patrick Harris's character with the, uh, the blue glasses and blue tint here and there. Thus taking the blue pill and staying within the Matrix. Um, I really enjoyed it, actually. I, I, and it's, it's funny, too, because I saw everyone not getting spoiler on it, but I saw everyone complaining about it before I even saw it in a little disheartening you know and, and i was I, I it made me not want to go in and and watch it right away because people that i like yourself and people that i respect when it comes to their opinions were were not liking it and saying they weren't liking it for whatever reason and 
but I, as a fan of the Matrix, I wanted to go in and still watch it. So I went in with low expectations, and uh, um, I actually really enjoyed it. I, I thought it was fun. I thought it was a nice chapter. If I had any complaints on it, um, I agree with you. I like. I think that um, the character of Trinity, I think where she kind of um, comes in as Trinity, I would like to have seen that sooner. And Jessica Henwick was great as Bugs. Um, I, I thought she was really good in that. But uh, I, I enjoyed it. I saw what they were trying to do uh, immediately. And I enjoyed the, if, I don't know if you want to call it a twist or a new direction. I was open to it. And uh, I enjoyed it. I, I do want to ask you one other thing before we move on about The Matrix. I want to ask you about Morpheus. Mm-hmm. Because obviously it wasn't Lawrence Fishburne in this. Um I'm a big fan of the actor who played him. I I don't want to mispronounce his name, but he played Black Manta in Aquaman. It was an interesting twist, but on one hand, too, it just felt like they made him important and then they kind of just pushed him to the side. You mean in the Matrix? Uh, in, the, in the Matrix yeah. Resurrections, yeah. He started off very important and he just kind of felt like by halfway through the film, he was just kind of pushed to the side and forgotten about. Because it's not his story. I, 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 he he had to be the connection um to bring me to bring neo back and then it was it the story belonged to other people that was the impression that i got i was fine with it just curious. so how would you rate the matrix kevin uh i'm i would actually buy it personally and i do plan to buy it i i liked it and uh uh, the reason why I liked it more than other people, I think, is because um, as much as I, I actually enjoy the original trilogy, I enjoy two a lot. Three, I get why people didn't like it and it has issues, but I still enjoy it. But I like that because of the way that three ended, this kind of made it a little more hopeful and also gave us some questions that are still kind of unanswered you know like do people now have the choice to stay in the matrix or to stay out of the matrix you know because there's a lot of us are going yeah hey, keep me in the matrix i like the taste of steak you know <laughs> um and, and i like that that question's out there and it's debatable no i, th- I think that's fair again i'm not going to go rally and hate on it it just didn't have everything that i was hoping for in it but that's the way it goes sometimes. Kevin, if you don't mind, I'm going to skip the next thing because I want to talk about Book of Boba Fett. We, obviously, if you listen to our What a Piece of Junk con, uh, podcast. The, re- the, reason sure. why I, the reason why I put my other thing forward is because I really wanted to save that towards the end. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. I, that, okay, then, let, then, then let's, let's, talk about, let's talk about yours. I would, I, then next, the, the, you, you watched the Amazon original film, which I have seen some ads for and I was interested in checking out. But it, didn't it just like come out today? Or was it within this week? It came out the seventh, I think it was. I can't remember, but yeah, just just recently. Yeah. Okay, so the movie is the Tender Bar, which has quite the cast in it. Yeah, I was kind of curious about it. I just saw it, you know, I saw it advertised on my Apple Plus, you know, and it kind of highlights certain things that are new. And I know, so wait a minute, is that Ben Affleck? And that's Ty Sheridan, uh, you know, from um, Ready Player One. I'm like, oh, this is interesting. And found out that it's based on a book and it's directed by George Clooney. And it takes place in the 70s and the 80s. And it's a coming of age story about a boy uh, who's later played by Ty Sheridan. Uh, But there's a younger kid in this that's absolutely amazing uh, that plays the younger version of him. Uh, Daniel Ranieri, I think his name, last name is. It's basically about a boy who is with his mom and they are forced to move back to her parents' house because uh, he has a deadbeat dad. Um, and uh, so they're all living underneath this house uh, of the grandfather played by Christopher Lloyd. And um, this mom wants his her son to go to college. She wants him to go to Yale, become a writer because he's really good at writing. And But the, the standout role here is Ben Affleck. He plays Uncle Charlie, the brother of the deadbeat dad, and he becomes the father figure and he teaches the boy men's science, the things that men and boys need to know growing up. And um, it's, it's very funny. It's very endearing. And Ben Affleck, in my opinion, one of his best roles ever. Um, he is such a, a great surrogate father to this young boy. And then you see him grow up and as the Ty Sheridan older character, and he goes to school and he goes and gets a job and, and, but he still comes back home to this bar that he spends a lot of time at as a little kid growing older, getting advice from uh, Ben Affleck and his, his friends. And just, just not like more like street smarts, 
not necessarily school smarts, but street smarts that people need to know. And uh, just brilliantly done. The, the music is great. And the, it's just like a great, a great uh, snapshot of the 70s and 80s. And I highly recommend it. Yeah, no, I haven't tend to check it out. So are you, how are you ranking it then, Kevin? Uh, definitely buy it. Definitely buy it. It's it's one of the new surprises of the year. Um, I got sucked into it right away um, of just the feeling for it. And like I said, Ben Affleck is amazing in it. Well done. So I'll, t- I'll talk about what I want to talk about next, and we'll save book for last until we have a little bit of time to work with that. Um, I watch a TV show that I've been actually very excited about for a while, but I just recently acquired the Stars Network through my YouTube TV subscription. Mm. And it's a show, if you're familiar, if you're an Arrow fan, you know who Stephen Amell is. Even if you're not really an Arrow fan, Stephen Amell has been a big part of fandom now for almost 12, 15 years and um, is one of the nicest guys you're ever going to meet. He, Stephen Amell is also a very big pro wrestling fan. He's actually competed in special events for both WWE and AEW. And he was off, he, he had just finished Arrow and he was offered the show that he, he said in a multiple pockets, it's the only show I would have come back so soon after Arrow to do, and that is Heels, a re- a show on stars that stars both Stephen Amell and Alexander Ludwig from the show Vikings, Kevin. And what the story of Heels is, is it's a small town in Georgia, Murphy, Georgia. And the small town is basically, the heart of it is this very old independent wrestling federation. And if you're not familiar with it, there's all, especially in the South, there's all these independent wrestling federations, you know, they're local guys. They kind of run a circuit. They get to a place, kind of stay there for a while. Heels focuses on this and how um, Stephen Amell and Alexander Ludwig play brothers. And Stephen Amell is the older brother and he's kind of taken over the wrestling federation after their father had committed suicide. And it's kind of his story about how he's, very old school wrestling and old school would tell the story, things like that. And how they're competing with this guy down in Florida. Who's got this big flashy Federation, but a lot of interpersonal drama as well. It's done very well. They've have several professional wrestlers who make appearances on this. And Kevin, former NFL star, James Harrison is a member of this cast as well. Oh, very cool. Well, it's filmed in Atlanta, Georgia area. So I'll be curious to check that out. Having spent a lot of time there, uh, I was just scrolling down. Apparently uh, Stephen Amell broke his back in October, 2020 performing a stunt scene for the first episode. Yeah. There, there's a scene where they call where they, and it's, it's done very rarely in professional wrestling where somebody will go to one corner of the top and get on the top rope and jump all the way across the ring and kick the guy in the other corner. And apparently he landed wrong and kind of got some micro fractures in his vertebrae and it halted everything for about six weeks while he was, before he was cleared to do stunts again. For the uninitiated, when it comes to uh, the terminology, what does heels mean and what does face mean? Okay. So heels are the bad guys, you know, they're, they're the ones that you want to boo that you want to just be all out against while well, faces they're baby faces they're the heroes they're the good guy they're the they're the hulk hogan back in the 80s characters the guys mm-hmm. who's always going to come up be kind of the superhero character and what what uh what what part does uh, Stephen amell play Stephen amell actually plays a heel but he's also the owner and run guy who is the what they call the booker the guy who writes the storylines for the f- that are going to be played out in the ring and he, so there's a lot of interesting things going on. It's actually a very quality drama show. And I would tell anybody to check that out. But I would, I, for me, it's a buy it. I'm a big Stephen Amell fan. I'm a you, may, you mentioned fan. it's on stars, right? Yeah, it, it is on stars right okay. now. Right now. It um, it's, it's definitely worth a check out. Kevin, you know what? I, I want to let the fans marinate just a little bit. Cause I want to take a quick break. And then when we come back, we're going to discuss the first three episodes of the book of Boba Fett here on culture clash. Thank you for listening. We hope you're enjoying this podcast. We'd like to continue to feed your ears by inviting you to listen to these other great shows on the Fandom Podcast Network. It starts with our flagship show, Culture Clash, discussing the latest in entertainment pop culture. Blood of Kings, Immortals Take Notice, our show covering the entire Highlander universe. Couch Potato Theaters, where we celebrate our favorite movies. Time Warp, the Fandom Flashback Podcast, discussing a year in movies and our favorite retro movie, and TV pop culture topics. Good evening, discussing all things Alfred Hitchcock. Union Federation, our Star Trek and Orville show. Hair Metal, 
the 80s and early 90s rock metal podcast. Type 40, our show covering the time-traveling Doctor Who universe with host Dan Hadley. Lethal Mullet, an 80s and 90s action film podcast with host Adam P. O'Brien. Also check out the Lethal Mullet Network for more great podcasts. What a Piece of Junk, a Star Wars podcast with hosts Scott, Derek, and Nathan. Making Treks, a Star Trek podcast. A deep dive into the final frontier with hosts Mark Newbold and Adam P. O'Brien. And check out our newest shows. The Fandom Show, our monthly fandom podcast network live YouTube exclusive show about the month's hottest topics in fandom. And the FPN True Believers MCU podcast discussing the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the related Marvel television and streaming MCU universe, including the connections to the original Marvel comics. You can find the Fandom Podcast Network on several platforms. Please subscribe to the Fandom Podcast Network YouTube channel to receive notifications of new podcast episodes and live events. You can enjoy all of the Fandom Podcast Network audio podcasts on our master feed at fpnet.podbean.com. The Fandom Podcast Network is on all major podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts and iTunes. You can find the Fandom Podcast Network on Facebook. You can email us at fandompodcastnetwork at gmail.com. You can also find the Fandom Podcast Network on Instagram at Fandom Podcast Network and on Twitter at FanPod Network. Thank you for listening, and remember, respect others and enjoy your fandom. And we're back, and hopefully you're enjoying everything we're doing on the Fandom Podcast Network. It's, it's a new year. Year six for us, Kevin. We're going into year six. Wow. Time flies. Jeez. Um, we're obviously doing a lot more for this year for YouTube. And again, always as always, striving to make better podcasts to feed your ears. So we hope you're enjoying everything you're, you're seeing here or listening to here on Culture Clash and all the great shows of the Fandom Podcast Network. But let's get back into some buy it, stream it, or unsee it. Because again, you might be listening to What a Piece of Junk or watching the YouTube episodes that they've put out covering episodes one and two of Boba Fett. They will be recording episode three here shortly. But Kevin, we like to talk Star Wars here too on Culture Clash. So let's talk about the first three episodes of Book of Boba Fett because it's been very interesting to watch the fan reaction to Boba Fett that we've seen over these first three episodes. I think for the most part, it's been a positive. A lot of people like it, but it's it definitely feels like it's not quite catching fire like the Mandalorian did. Uh, to say the least, if, if you if, if you count what people are saying about the third episode, uh, I think it's a little more decisive than that, Kyle. I think it's getting towards uh, Last Jedi almost. See, I and I, you know, I I see I see where especially after this last episode, people are being like that, but. I think people are missing some of the fun of Star Wars. Um, I've enjoyed all three episodes. I'll be honest with you. I thought the first episode was not as good as I was hoping it to be. I think the Mandalorian had a lot more freedom to work with. I think in the second episode, they really started to find their footing a lot more. And personally, I liked a lot of the concepts and ideas they executed in the third episode. And come on, having Danny Trejo as a Rancor trainer, that's, what else do you need in life? Come on. But I can understand where there's some of the criticisms, especially involving the cybernetic gang that was introduced there. I don't really have a problem with them. I understand some people are making some Power Ranger jokes because of the colors of their, their things or Vespa jokes because their bikes do look a little odd for being in Tatooine. But you know what? You got to have a little fun with it. You got to let it play out and see where, where it's going to go. I really like, the fact that they're diving more into the modern current timeline of Boba Fett, where dealing with now the Pike as being a major threat and seeing some of these other characters come up like black Creston or uh, the, the twins and just kind of building that up more in that time frame and getting a l less on the flashbacks and more on the current time. Like they did in episode three, but everything I've enjoyed every episode so far without question. I've really enjoyed this series thus far and uh, it's, it's been so much fun and I just, I'm really um, basking in the new star Wars and I, I, I really enjoyed this take and how they're going. I, um, I think the criticism that this series have gotten has just gotten way out of hand and ridiculous. It, it is, it is just, it's, it's depressing to be honest with you, I get 
the criticism. Okay, you don't like the 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 speeder bikes, the Vespa space bikes. I get that. It's how it's being done is what I don't understand and is i is is depressing. If you don't like something in Star Wars, it's fine. Just mention it. That didn't do it for me. But is there anything else that you liked? You know, do you have to pound the table on one or two things and let that be your platform? Did you enjoy anything else? Did you enjoy the Rancor? Did you enjoy the the fight with Boba Fett? Did you enjoy these other little things? You know, it's just uh, it's it's how it's being how the criticism is being delivered is frustrating, but also I I don't respect it if you're going to be that way. You know, be constructive about it, and then you know, it, it and then deliver your point. But it's. To me, it's uh, it's been a little frustrating for me because now I'm afraid to um, not say anything at all on social media, whether I liked it or not, you know, and I'm personally enjoying it. Yes, there's things they can nitpick, but uh, it's to me, it's been one of the most exciting things to en- enjoy on TV lately. And, uh, you know, I know uh, the most famous meme out there right now is uh, what I wanted and it shows the original you know, bounty hunters on the Star Destroyer from Empire Strikes Back. What I got, and it shows Boba Fett and Fennec Shan with the the bikers, the the Vespa bikers behind it. And it's like, you know, I knew going into the book of Boba Fett, we weren't going to get like a lot of, you know, pre-Empire Strikes Back stuff because you have to tie it into the Mandalorian and what goes on. We might get, yes, a few uh, uh, backstories. And I got that, you know, and we're getting that. And I, I like the stuff that ties back to the, the the stuff that's in the flashbacks. It's kind of tying into the current day Boba Fett stuff. You know, we want to know what's happening with Boba Fett now. And I'm really enjoying it. I'm enjoying the story. And I could nitpick, you know, the, uh, um, the speeder bike special effects. But this is a TV budget, you know. Um, this isn't a movie budget. And it didn't bother me. I, I'm getting more into the story itself and the question that's answered. And I, you know... The fact that we're not getting all the questions answered in every single episode, I'm fine with that. I want it makes me more excited for the next one, and uh, um, I'm just gonna enjoy Boba Fett on my own. So here, here's the thing for me: one, this series isn't done yet. We're only into episode three of seven. Let's wait and see what we've got as a whole before we jump to any conclusions. Well, I say that I did think if if anything in episode three kind of was off putting to me was. It did feel like the whole chase sequence between the land speeder and the speeder bikes felt slow. And I, I don't know why it, why they've decided made that decision, but it is what it what is. Do you mean, what do you mean it felt we, slow? I, I What? What do you mean? It felt like the vehicles were moving in slow motion to me compared to what we're used to speeders moving at in within star Wars. Well, but, in close, in close uh, quarters, uh, um, streets that was, I didn't catch up on that at all. I thought it was normal. Yeah, but again, that's just a, something I caught that just felt like it could have been a felt like it should have been a little faster. But I, I get I get your point too, and it's a valid it's a valid point. But it doesn't take away from my enjoyment of the show. That's again just making a point of that was something. But it, I still enjoy the show, and that's and that's the bottom line. And I think for everybody who wants to just attack and attack and attack, it's one thing to have okay, I didn't like this, and say this is why I didn't like this, and that's your opinion. But that doesn't mean you have to ha- attack everybody else who has a different opinion. You know, we're, we're entitled it's to not, like what we it, like. It's not the attacking other people. It's the, um, it's the way you present your argument. That's what people are forgetting. It's an optics thing, you know. And then, then coming back and saying it again and again, and then trying to justify it. It's it's like, you know. <laughs> you got you got to you got to realize how you deliver your information, you know that that that's the important part. And uh, I will not take you seriously if you keep saying it over and over again, and you want to jump on it and make it sound like it is the worst thing ever. It's it's just, I, I it's just something to become a, a little desensitized to a little bit of it. And like if I'm if you want to make your point across, just say it once, say it strong. But don't don't try to beat my head over it, and uh, don't make it sound like it's the end of the world when it's not. It's Star Wars, guys. 
we we can go back to the original trilogy and nitpick certain things there. And we have, we've done it for years, but we used to do it differently, you know, back in the day. And we didn't have to, uh, you know, feel like we have to stand a platform. If one thing bugged me or a couple things bugged me, this is not what I wanted, you know, but this is what we're going to get. If you don't like it, move on. Exactly. It is what it is. You can choose to like it or you can choose not to watch it. That's the great thing about it. You have that choice. But yeah, for, for me, Boba Fett so far is still a buy it, Kevin, for the first yeah, three episodes. Definitely. I'm thoroughly, really enjoying thoroughly it. Been really, really enjoying entertained. it. Entertained. I think we get, I'll, I'll be honest, I think some people are maybe were a little spoiled by The Mandalorian because The Mandalorian was so outstanding. And that and I'm saying book and uh, Boba Fett's just different. And it's not The Mandalorian. And I'm glad it's not The Mandalorian. So, right. It is what it is. But, Kevin, and I know you. I know you've been away, and you're still recovering from Vegas, and what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. But what happens in the basement of antiquities at the Fan of Podcast Network? Sometimes we just can't control it. You know what that sound is, Kyle? Uh, that sound scares the living bejeebus out of me. <laughs> That's the magic eight ball. We always, I always ask you to ask a question before we start the magic eight ball segment. Oh, this this is an easy one this week. Magic eight ball. Will Kevin's voice last through the rest of the show? As I see it, yes. <laughs> That's what it says. <laughs> the, the challenge that has was been a, issued. That was a safe question, Kyle. Come on. <laughs> uh, well, okay. I, I'll ask you one more question then, Kevin. Okay. Let me shake it up. Let me shake it up. Come on, let's shake it up. Let's shake it Magic up. eight ball. Are Kevin and I going to change movies? Are what? Are Kevin, you and I, are we going to change movies with this segment? Change movies? What kind of question? Yeah, are we going to change? Are we going to change how movies are made? Oh, okay. You got to say it like that because that was <laughs> confusing. That even the eight ball was going, huh? <laughs> uh, concentrate and ask again. <laughs> <laughs> See, you should have let the eight ball speak first. <laughs> it knows it knows you too well, Kyle. Ah, uh, well, you know. So, yes, the Magic 8-Ball category this week, Kevin, is the movies that changed movies or as the, the movies that we've seen that have been made that have changed filmmaking in films. It may not be the best movie ever, but there was an aspect of it that just completely changed the movie industry and how we maybe even as viewers change, watch the films, Kevin. Movie Game Changers. What groundbreaking movies changed the future of movie making? So now we, this kind of started as a conversation between Kevin and I, and then it kind of morphed into this segment. Now, Kevin, just do we want to throw out a few examples of what we're talking about here? You know, to give uh, not unless it spoils idea. our uh, our our stuff on the list. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> I think once we start getting into it, people understand what that means. You know, we've all been to movies that wowed us through experience visually sound uh, or just being in a theater. And these movies have been referenced over and over again. Not since this movie came out, has this ever happened or because this movie came out, we're allowed to do this or allowed to see that. Um, I say we get, uh, uh, I say we get into the, um, maybe the fans responses first, maybe, um, or did you want to wait till later? I was going to say maybe do the fans first. Cause it might ring something true for us as we're going in there. Absolutely. So Kevin, why don't you weigh, weigh in with the social media? All right. So yeah, we got a lot of great responses on Facebook here. And I mentioned that, uh, um, the magic eight ball game movie game changers on the next culture clash. Now, podcast, we ask, what groundbreaking movies changed the future of movie making and why? What movies did you see for the first time that wowed you for their cinematic achievement? Kyle and I will be picking our top eight movie game changers. Please share your comments below and we'll read them on the podcast. And we got some great responses, starting with our friend Jennifer says, the first ones that come to mind are Jaws, Jurassic Park, and Toy Story. Jaws gave us the blockbuster must-see movie. The dinosaurs in Jurassic Park were stunning and so different from Land of the Lost. Toy Story was amazing for animation. Those three immediately come to mind. My buddy David Walsh says, The Dark Knight for injecting gritty realism in Oscar-level production and acting to the comic book genre. Star Trek II for giving us CGI and the beginning of Pixar. Tom Caldwell said, Pulp Fiction. 
And I want to read Tom's here because uh, I'm going to come back to this. Tom said, I took film appreciation at University of Saskatchewan from the late great professor Don Kerr. We were assigned to see Pulp Fiction. How cool is that, Kyle, to be in a class and you're assigned to see Pulp Fiction? <laughs> that is very, very cool. See that? that is awesome. I, I wish I could have taken a class like that. So they were assigned to see Pulp Fiction in the theaters that had just come out. And we spent a three-hour class talking about the film. I loved it. It was a non-sequential timeline thing. It was groundbreaking. It challenged you to think. And the violence and hard language was also refreshing change from all of the tripe that was in theaters at the time. Quentin's love of old music, cereal boxes, and retro Americana was reflected on the Coke mirrors of time. The extreme of drug use and the depravity that these characters survive were entertaining as hell. To this day, this movie generates memes and pop culture references and merch sales, which only prove how enduring and impactful this film was. A great response by Tom, uh, and I'm going to come back to this a little bit later. John Givis says, Airplane changed how comedy movies were made. Great suggestion. I love this. We don't have a lot of comedies on our list, Kyle. I don't know if we have any comedies on our own list, but I'm glad that Airplane was mentioned because he is right. Our friend Johnny K said Star Wars 1977 because of how how F did they do it with those special effects, space battles, etc. Brought sci-fi to a new level of respect, and without it, we might not have gotten Alien, a string of great Star Trek movies, and more. Jurassic Park, new uh, VFX swung for the fences, and they hit a home run. Throwing a curveball and going with The Rock redefined action movies and gave birth to Michael Bay style, which led to so many huge blockbusters and new franchises. Not everyone's cup of tea, but you have to admit it was big, loud game changer from which most modern action blockbusters can trace their origins. He's got a very interesting point there, Kyle. I wouldn't have thought of that straight off, but the rock did kind of produce a lot of copycat style, big budget action. A lot of people, hate love michael bay i'm apologist we know people that hate him what do you think of that observation that johnny k said i i actually agree with it because i do think it i think michael bay changed action films whether it's people's opinion of good good bad or other otherwise i i do think he changed action films and i think the rock is a big example of that just like i think you kind of have the rock and the armageddon in that michael and armageddon in that michael bay con air I, too yeah you know yeah yeah Definitely. So, you know, I, I, will, I will say this. We're not going to do this on the podcast, but I, at some point we will get a Matt Clifton take about that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Johnny K goes on and says, think about how many times you've seen the phrase, but after the success of Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> I, wish I wish I had a dollar every time. Yeah. Also, he said, and Batman 1989 for injecting gritty realism and Oscar winning production to the comic book genre. Well said. Our buddy over there at uh, What a Piece of Junk host, uh, Scott Botman, said The Matrix, the rebirth of the hard sci-fi and evolution of martial arts films, plus bullet time. Citizen Kane, most invented, most invented multiple camera angles, wipes, time jumps between scenes, transitions between scenes. Before this, before this, movies were just recorded stage plays. Interesting. The Jazz Singer, um, how about some sound with your picture? Still have not seen Citizen Kane, Kyle. Have you? Neither have I. No, this might be worse than Venom. <laughs> <laughs> Our good friend Lacey Adderhold, um, uh, an awesome contributor here and uh, someone who knows her movie Kung Fu very well. I feel like every department has a set of game changers. The dolly zoom, steady cam, crane dolly positions are ton of game changers in cinematography alone. Script, seven, usual aspects, six cents. Special effects, Stargate, Star Trek Matrix. Practical effects, start with Harryhausen and work through Gilmore Del Toro's Nightmares. So many directions this can go. And the further back you go, the more impressive the breakthroughs. Look at Citizen Kane, Double Identity, Double Indemnity, excuse me. Anything by John Ford and Alfred Hitchcock. Good point. The lighting efforts made it pre-color, then the makeup and costume changes required for Technicolor. Not to mention Technicolor itself was a huge game changer. The sound, start with a jazz singer and then jump forward 100 plus years to THX, Dolby, etc. The changes in film stock from 8mm to 16mm, 35mm to 70mm and eventually transitioned to digital to 
R-E-D to iPhones and Androids. Well said. I like how technical she got there. She's totally right. A lot of game changers there. Yes. She is the queen of movie foo. This is true. And I want to give a special shout out to our last comment here by Colleen Best. She says, The Perils of Pauline, starring Pearl White. She did her own stunts and proved what a female could do in the lead in the series of pictures. Uh, and she's referring to the first film that starred many of um, uh, P- Perils of Pauline. Came out in 1914, Kyle. And I had a funny little interesting trivia about this. Uh, Milton Burrow claimed this was his first film appearance playing a character of a young boy, but this had never been confirmed. Interesting. Well, some great commentary from social media and obviously, you know, some people we know that we know they've got some quite quality movie chops to make those kind of comments. So thanks everybody from social media for weighing in. Yeah. But thank Kevin, you guys. It's, it's time to get into our own thoughts on this. And let's start with some honorable mentions. Um, would you like to throw a few out there first, Mr. Reitzel? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of start early on uh, and then kind of go up until uh, current day. But I'm going to mention The Wizard of Oz, 1939, um, for obvious reasons, the spectacle of this, the musical in this, the production of this. Uh, I recently listened to a podcast that... Uh, talked about the dark side of this film and it was pretty oh, yeah. bad <laughs> yeah it's got an interesting size um, that we a lot of people don't know about i originally saw that movie in black and white because all we had was a black and white tv so i thought it was a black and white movie then finally i saw it on a color television realized that part of the film's in black and white and then jumps to color with a great effect and that totally surprised me uh, i'm going to mention a movie called winchester 73 that came out in 1950 uh, starring james stewart and i recently discovered this film about 10 years ago and i actually bought it on dvd and the reason why this is important um and you're wondering why this obscure western is so is on this list in 1950 james stewart one of the biggest stars in the world realized that he could make more money if he broke his studio contract and made the unheard of a move to become independent because that's what a lot of stars did they signed contracts with movie studios in a way they were kind of slaves to these contracts well he wanted to broke out of it do this instead and universal immediately jumped on the chance of having the star in a new film but couldn't afford his asking price being the visionary that he was stewart had his salary tied to the gross of the film this quickly became the standard practice and continues today a couple of more i'll throw out uh, sound of music probably the most iconic um musical of all time and especially in the way that was shot on location production value ben-hur 1959 one of the most um i would say when it comes to grandiose action filmmaking of all time with that big chariot race at the end Uh, a lot of people could throw cleopatra out there as well but this was just fantastic action done with just a huge cinematic um appeal to it so uh you got a few that you want to throw out there now yeah i do i'm not, mine are gonna be a little bit more of a recent time but i want to start with the abyss kevin because with that film first of all the technology that was used for the water effect in that movie was groundbreaking and led to something else i'm going to mention here shortly but also the how james cameron made that film building that tank and using a lot of cutting edge diving technology at the time you know going with everything that they used and that was practical and yeah didn't it didn't he like actually invent some things to to help make that film like whether it was oh, yeah. you know like why he and how he invented the camera rigs and there's something like that if i remember correctly yeah, a lot of the camera rigs, even some of the diving equipment itself with the aspect of, you know, having the helmet and, st- and the type of helmets they had instead of just the respirator that yeah. those, those yeah. were big. Also, he filmed this, I think it was, what was it? Uh, uh, a rea- I think it was an old nuclear reactor or something. <laughs> it was that something or, crazy. Yeah, yeah. It was something, I don't know if it was a reactor, but just like it was basically a big like the oil thing or something. Yeah, yeah. it was, it was, it was, it was crazy yeah. that I, I think they still on the Blu-ray are on the, there's a Blu-ray of this coming out finally. So that I'm very excited about. But if oh, you nice. Special, special edition DVD. There's a great um, documentary about how he filmed this. That's worth checking out. Um, speaking of the abyss and that technology, it made 
a huger impact in Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Obviously, mm -hmm. the liquid T-1000, that effect was huge. But I also think Terminator 2 changed summer movies. I think I think it was just such a huge pop cultural thing. And I think it really was one of the more recent movies to change pop culture and change how, you know, we had the Guns N' Roses video with it at the mix mm -hmm. of mtv tying in you with could it. be Schwar mine yeah yeah, yeah. Sch schwarzenegger just becoming a totally different kind of super hollywood superstar with this film i mean he yeah he ordered but he just went to a level i don't think anybody else has really kind of touched as far as what he was so yeah definitely terminator 2 and i also want to throw out blade kevin because in my opinion blade saved the superhero movie we, we, we had other films from yeah. earlier on, obviously the 89 Batman and some of those ones. But then we went through a drought and then we had some bad movies, a lot of direct-to-video kind of things, projects that couldn't come off the ground. And then Blade came out and just blew everybody's mind. Nobody expected anything from Blade and it was huge. Obviously, Blade got two other films. Blade 2 is considered by a lot to be the best of the Blade films. But without the first Blade, there is no MCU. There is no Snyderverse. There is no... DC Blade saved the comic book movies and it, it changed everything. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So you have a few more that you want to throw out, Kevin, because there's a couple on this list I have a few quick thoughts about that you have. As I yeah, know. I want to start off with the good, the bad, and the ugly because of uh, defining the uh, the Western achievements that it did and a lot of copycats that came after that. And that came out in 66 uh, Godfather part two. I didn't mention Godfather, but I mentioned Godfather part two because of the success of a sequel and how a lot of people like this one, the sequel better than the original and uh, the way that it was shot in its editing and the way that you would see uh, the time done. Uh, the original Alien film, uh, what it did for sci-fi horror to a certain degree and the, the franchise that it started, but also starting like a real starting like the female hero. And uh, what we got was Sigourney Weaver and that being a main star instead of it being always a male, you know, the Muppet movie. I want to mention the Muppet movie because of what it did uh, just for, um, you know, you know, these characters that we fell in love with, like on Sesame Street and stuff like that. And uh, also bringing Muppets and puppetry uh, into this mainstream and then becoming on the TV series and the other sequels that it does. I think in, in the world of Jen, Jim Henson, I think was so uh, important as well. American werewolf in London for its special effects and um, uh, kind of really pushing the, uh, the love of horror films. Uh, Aaron and I did a special last year on the horror films of 1981. And this was one of the ones that we highlighted because 81 was a breakout year for horror films. Uh, Blade Runner for obvious reasons, the film noir, the special effects, uh, and, uh, you know, just the great cast and the great acting on that. Um, I want to give a throw uh, a shout out to the original Terminator, the way this kind of started this bleak world that we were going to go into and uh, how it, the, the end of the world was going to happen as we know it, but preparing yourself for the worst and the practical effects that they used for the Terminator and Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, were groundbreaking at the time, especially for the limited budget. A lot of people in the next film, these two films came out the same year, but a lot of people will give the breakfast club, the, uh, um, the nod for the, the beginning or the iconic Brat Pack movie. I'm going to give a shout out. And a lot of this, I'm going to give credit to my lovely fiance. Aaron is actually the other movie that came out that year is St. Elmo's fire. Breakfast club was all about high school in a contained area. Same Elmo's fire is what happens when you leave high school and you have to deal with the real world and the real world ramifications. And there was, it was a lot more gritty and it was uh, dealing with, uh, you know, drugs and all kinds of stuff. And uh, to me, I'm kind of leaning towards Sam Elmo's fire being the real brat pack uh, uh, movie there. Saving private Ryan gritty war film gave us probably the best uh rendition of d-day and the horrors of war in a very gritty way and last but not least of my honorable mentions the blair witch project not because whether you like the film or not it's more about how it was done and how a twenty thousand dollar film made millions and when you 
jump forward to the paranormal activity movies that all cost like less than a million dollars or really, but are making millions and millions in the theater budget films, armchair directors and fans giving a chance to make these films and do them well for a small amount of money. And then making a crap load of money in the theater. You have some comments on this guy. Yeah. I had a couple on, on these. First of all, Blair Witch Project basically starts a whole new genre. The lost footage film. genre. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Or at you, least perfects you, you, it anyway. <laughs> yeah. But there's two on here I, I specifically have a couple of comments on. I want to talk about the Muppet movie in American Werewolf in London. The Muppet movie to this day still has one of the most astounding special effects in it ever. And that is Kermit riding the bicycle. Yeah, yeah. Good call. I, yep. And, it, and it, it really established the Muppets to something huge. And to me, the transformation sequence in an American Werewolf in London is still to this day one of the greatest effect scenes of all time. And I think completely changed how people looked at doing effects, practical and later on down the line, because that was the bar set for a very long time until another film c- came out, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but it's still one of the greatest effects of all time. One of the best seven seconds of uh, special effects ever done. Yeah. So, Kevin, let us get into our main lists, our eight ball picks as they were. These are in no particular order, but I do have a – let me actually wait a second. Let me rewind a little bit. You, you, wait, you have some more honorable mentions. You have some more honorable, honorable mentions. Mention. Yeah. yeah. Let me rewind a little bit. A couple more honorable mentions. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Yeah. I think that started a genre or brought maybe even brought back a genre, the young adult film genre. Obviously, Harry Potter, worldwide sensation, but I really think that was a film, too, that brought back – the books to movie movie in a really big way. And I mean, just right. changed how everybody looks at everything. The raid, I think changed action movies, changed martial arts movies. And I think changed how people absorb foreign films as well. These, the, 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 just the intensity of the action of the raid being a foreign film. I think a lot of people went to check it out. And I think it's re- the raid is one of the films responsible for opening up a people's minds a lot more to foreign film. Now, when we look at Netflix and see like all the Korean films and things yeah. like that are on Netflix, I think the raid was the precursor to that. Yeah. What and, it did for our hand to hand combat and stuff was just amazing and realize you don't have to have guns in every action scene. You know, it was just amazing. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the, the different type, the way it was shot too. That was another thing. And the, the cinematic aspect to the raid was just phenomenal. And then I went back to the future, the original film, obviously the trilogy changed, changed a lot of things, but to me, back to the future is the, it was this and top gun established the summer long movie just in the theater all summer long. It was that (laughs) big of a blockbuster. Yeah. It just never left the theater like that. And, I just, and it, obviously shooting Michael J. Fox to the stratosphere and just be, you know, that kind of movie that like everybody loved. And I, but I just think to me, that's what I remember back to the future for is that all summer long blockbuster. Yeah. It, movies were more affordable back then. <laughs> and the fact that you couldn't uh, put anything on demand a few months later, it was just something that, um, in a way it kind of, it was kind of a babysitter too, which is great. And you know, that's one of the things I experienced when I was a kid, my parents would just send me the movie theaters all day and they could have a chance to do other stuff, but reliving that in the theater and the adventure every day was just something I I miss. It was so much fun. Yeah, it was. And it just, it brings back so many great memories, but now Kevin, let's get into our actual eight ball picks. Now these, it's a list, but it's not necessarily in particular order from first. It's just kind of a random list here that Kevin and I put both have our thoughts on. So Kevin, would you like, you went first with honorable mentions. Would you like me to start with my list first? Yeah, yeah, sure. Go for it. Okay. So first film on my list is the Avengers. And Kevin, for me, the reason why the Avengers makes this is this is the, this is a film. Nobody thought would ever get made. Not, this type of film, you know, we've, we, we had the individual superhero movies, but to have this big group together like this of legitimate first rate superhero together on this grandiose scale to be the a crowning achievement of phase one of the MCU. And the, everybody forgets because they want to go back and think Disney, this film was made before Disney acquired Marvel studios. Right. The only thing yeah. they, they, Disney acquired this film 
after this film was made, right? And Disney put in a lot of the marketing for the Avengers, but this film was done and made. And Kevin, this is easily one of still in my probably top three all time greatest superhero films. It just it works on every level, and just to bring all these pieces together at a time we thought we would never see it in our lives. And I just it's still to this day my greatest theater going experience with an amazing crowd and everybody so into it. It was just phenomenal. The anticipation and the build up to it was just palpable. I mean, it was uh, the excitement was so thick in the air you could cut it. And seeing, you know, when you look back now, where we are now with the MCU, it seems like so long ago because so much has come out since then. But it was impressive for how much that came out to set the stage for the Avengers and these heroes that had their separate movies. Um, or if the characters were in the film that didn't have their own movies, they were still in other films, you know, and, and seeing it all come together for that one moment was such a big deal. And I remember that as well. Well, well deserved to be on this list. Now, Kevin, you have actually one of my all time favorites in on your number eight. Number eight was Tron for me. Um, and, and I did want to say before I go further, a lot of these aren't necessarily in the most important order. Ours, I, I did kind of want to match some of yours so we can talk about it at the same time. But there's a few of these I could switch back and forth. But they're in, they're all in the top eight for a good reason. But Tron was it for me because I remember playing the video game. I remember uh, the trailers going into it and never and not seeing anything like that with the special effects ever before and what it was doing for early computer animation as well just made the movie so much more entertaining as a theater experience and i'm going to be touching on this more with our list not only is are we talking about these films because of the the cinematic masterpieces they might be in one way or another or in filmmaking or the impact but also the experience itself and how it created a, a thing um, going to the theaters as well. Oh, absolutely. And I think that weighed in a lot on my, my list as well. And Tron, tr again, it's, it's, to me, it's a very important film. I love Tron. It's one of my all time favorite films. I'm a big fan of Tron legacy as well. I didn't get to see Tron in the theaters it's, until it was like released later on when legacy came out. They did some theaters did that. I was living in Alaska. Just, didn't have a sh very short run in Alaska, but I did see it on home video and it just imagine on my mind. Imagine seeing that on the big screen with the light cycles and the tanks. I mean, it was just, it blew me. It blew me out of the water. It was amazing. Yeah. The, the, that's the light since, cycle. That's not since like Raiders lost Ark and, and star Wars. Was there an experience in the theater? So yeah, it was great. And again, like you said, the light cycles, the recognize that, that whole world and how they film that and the unique way yeah. they film that. Plus two, I think it was the announcement of the computer age is here. Yep. You know, yep, yep. Deal with it. So, okay. Number seven on my list for me, Kevin, is the Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring. Now, some people say, oh, you could say Return of the King. The reason why the Fellowship is so important is because we never thought we'd see this. We honestly had, it was a pipe dream. There was no way these Tolkien films were going to be put on the big screen. It was too ambitious. It was too crazy not only did they do it they pulled it off fantastically I, I remember just walking out and being blown away from watching the fellowship of the ring and dying knowing i had to wait another two years for the two towers to come out but not only that Gollum, and yes we get more of Gollum in later films but it establishes andy circus and yes andy Smeagol. Circus, Smeagol. <laughs> I, i'm not gonna lie as far as his performing in that digital performance, it was perfected in the um, Planet of the Apes films that Andy Serkis did. I, that he should have won an, the man should have won an Oscar for those films. I'm sorry, but to have that and to have this movie that just nobody thought would ever see the light of day, Kevin, other than maybe in an animation or something like that, was just you didn't believe it even when you got out of it that you just actually saw that. Correct me if I'm wrong, Kyle. I. And I'm asking this question because I'm, off the top of my head, I can't remember. But at this time, I was working for the Decipher Game Company, and we had gotten a license prior to the release of these films to produce the uh, the trading card game and also be the official uh, fan club, uh, which produced the magazine uh, that came out quarterly as well as the role-playing game. But this was the first that I remember of a trilogy being 
all filmed together at once. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at back to the future, they did the first one, then the next two, same thing with the matrix first one, then the next two, was there another trilogy planned and filmed all together over a two year, however long it took. I know they went back for reshoots, which is normal, but this was a big deal. They went into this going, we're going to do these three books and we're going to take our time doing it. And we're going to, you know, Merrimax or whoever it was that was producing this, put in a ton of money on this thing. Went all down to uh, New Zealand, had the Weta workshop, do all of the practical and special effects and all that kind of stuff. Was there another trilogy that was filmed as a trilogy all at once before? I don't think so. Not that I can recall. And honestly, I don't think there's been one since. E not film like this, not film where they just committed for like they did uh, the, the, the Hobbit like the, trilogy, maybe that followed. I don't it? even think I, I don't even think they filmed it quite like they did with because if you remember too, they ended they, up the Hobbit, the Hobbit, but film. the Hobbit films were all filmed. They were they were all planned. Uh, I I don't know if they were planned as a trilogy. Maybe they were originally planned as two films, and then I think they decided to do a trilogy. But they were all still being done around the same time. But still outside of it. My point is the production of this and the amount of time and energy. I mean, the actors bonded together on this and they had to come back like two years later to film some scenes to, to, to patch some things up was just groundbreaking as it was a spell. And one of the most well done trilogies of all time. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, like I said, even the Hobbit I don't, I just don't, it, ha, it didn't have that special feeling like this did. Right. This was just spectacular. Right. You, you got number seven on your list, Kevin? Yeah. Um, we mentioned it earlier and I mentioned Batman 1989. Um, obviously for how gritty, you know, you could get a superhero uh, a comic book movie on the big screen. But to me, Batman 89 for another reason is, um, one of the most influential because it was the first time I remember seeing teasers for this film when it comes to posters and when it comes to trailers over a year before it came out, that wasn't done before. I remember there was that video cassette tape of just the trailer that was circulating in the early comic cons and stuff like that. And you just saw the Batman one sheet and you see Nicholson, you see Keaton um, but going to this experience was a midnight movie and the excitement of experimenting, knowing this was going to be an instant blockbuster. Everyone wanted to see this. Everyone that you knew, uh, all your friends. I remember who I was with and the group that I went with to go see this midnight premiere. Uh, it was such a big deal, Kyle. Uh, I, and I would say kind of set a precedence for midnight blockbuster premieres was this Batman 89. I, there might've been some midnight premieres prior to that, that Batman movie, but this was the biggest one of all and the most impactful. And I think the way movies were marketed, uh, not necessarily superhero films more. Yes. Came later, but the, that, that, that uh, opening night impact that studio, studios wanted to get a lot of their money from and how to market a film, I think is the, uh, the, the, the impact that this movie made in addition to what you actually saw on the screen. You hit the nail on the head because to me, Batman 89 changed how movies were marketed forever. I don't remember a movie marketed like Batman. I mean, Batman 89 was, everywhere i remember the first movie poster came out that was just the bat symbol and that was yeah. it and people were just losing their minds how many batman I mean, t-shirts did you see after that you know uh, yeah. before the movie uh, came out I, and just every i mean batman was everywhere you had posters books toys yeah. comic book yeah. graphic novels being reprinted it was it was insane and on top of all of that they pulled the movie off i mean yeah. i remember walking out of that movie i ended up seeing that movie like i think six times in one week that first yeah. week if you could get tickets, but yeah. yeah, it, that changed it. It it was an all summer long movie, kind of like back to the future or top gun, but it just, you, it was one of those ones you walked out and you went, things are never going to be the same. Yep. And yep. That, that's how I remember walking out of Batman. But speaking of things are never going to be the same. We kind of, let's just talk about this. We both have it as number six on our list, a movie that to this 
day, I remember being just absolutely mind blown by this film. And it changed how movies were made for the next 20 plus years. And that's the matrix. Yeah. And yep, again, one of the, again, one of the most genius marketing campaigns ever. What is the matrix? What's in the matrix? What is the matrix? And it was like, what, what are they talking about? What's this matrix thing that everybody's talking about? It's, it's weird. I don't remember the, the pre hype for it. I'll be honest with you, Kyle, because I was working for that game company and so we kind of had our hands in other fandoms and the matrix for us was just kind of an afterthought. We'd seen trailers for it, you know, uh, cause it, it, it was like, I'll be honest with you. We had star Wars episode one, the phantom menace on our mind because that was coming out that year and we were getting ready to promote it. So for us, it was kind of an afterthought. We just kind of, we all went to it after work one day and it just blew us away, but we didn't have this pre hype like everyone else did. Is that weird? No, I don't think so when it comes to the Matrix, because I think there are a lot of people that didn't get pulled in until after the movie came out and word of mouth hit about it. I, I just remember seeing this in the theater and seeing bullet time as they even make reference to that in Matrix Resurrections and just the environment and the story they told was something it felt a little Terminator. It felt something new. It felt just so impressive and just, again, using this digital world that we were slowly diving ourselves into at that point, point even more so. And just looking back at it now, it's just, it's a movie that you, even to this day, I can, I'll watch the first matrix film and just, I just shake yeah. my head and go, yeah. it's just mind blowing. It's just, yeah. it's, and it's so many, everything. you did want to mention another film, which I was happy that you uh, wanted to talk about when we were going to bring up the matrix, wasn't it? Or was that another movie? I can't remember. Yeah, it was, it's another, it's another movie. We'll, which is on your list, which I know we'll get to okay. here shortly. Gotcha. So, gotcha. Um, Coming in at number five, that's six on both of our lists. Number five for me, Kevin, this is a little bit before my time, but I just knowing the history of this film and everything like that, Jaws. And I know Jennifer mentioned this. Jaws changed summer blockbusters. Yep. Jaws, this, the, Jaws this started it. The Jaws started the summer blockbuster. How the, the If you hear the crazy stories about the filming of Jaws, all the mechanical problems with Bruce the shark and just the whole history of it, and still one of the greatest moments in cinematic history you're gonna need a bigger boat i mean J jaws created the summer blockbuster and uh kept everyone out of the water for a while <laughs> yeah, it, <laughs> but yes exactly it did. it did yep yep um number five for you this was a cultural phenomenal and changing film kevin 1994 pulp fiction i told you i wanted to come back to this uh tom did a great job and and talking about the impact that movie had for him and uh, he hit all the right notes on it for me personally i was always going into movies enjoying what i was seeing in front of the camera didn't pay a lot of attention to what was happening behind the camera and how things were being made and not paying attention to editing and uh you know cinema photography but more importantly the spoken word the script writing coming out of this film I had never wanted to listen to people talk more than I did after this film. And I had seen Reservoir Dogs and I understood, I was kind of starting to understand what was going on, but it took Tarantino for his, for his, uh, this film, I guess his second film here to really master the art of script and people just talking and finding it fascinating. But the other thing to this film and Tom touched on it was the editing of this film. So this, this movie itself, I walked out of it going, wow, I want to know more about the process of putting films together, editing, and how important editing is. And we wouldn't have Star Wars if it wasn't for the Oscar-winning editor that was married to, to uh, uh, George Lucas. His wife helped edit that film. You know, And if that's not done correctly, it's that movie might have a different trajectory. Pulp Fiction mastered this, mastered editing, mastered the spoken word on the script. And Tarantino, thank you for bringing that to us and making us love movies more because of that. And uh, that movie, but it just affected me personally. And I'm sure a lot of people would feel the same about it. What about you, Kyle? Pulp Fiction turned our generation, people of our age, give or take a few years, 
into cinema files. Yes. Well said. Perfect. Well said. I mean, it it changed. Honestly, I don't think any other movie changed people's perspective of how they looked at how a film was made. Yeah. And through from top to bottom. And I, I mean, Pulp Fiction was just it blew everybody's minds. It was it just it just changed perceptions. And there's very few movies that to me that do that. Even I don't even think like when I think about like some of the other movies we've talked about, they didn't change perceptions like the way Pulp Fiction changed the perception of watching a movie for a whole generation. So right, yeah, well done. Um, number four on my list is a movie that I believe changed children's films and animation forever, and that is to- the original Toy Story. Kevin, yep. yep. Hello, Pixar. <laughs> um. Hello, digital animation. And for as much as I love digital animation and I love these films and I love Pixar, it was also kind of a sad day because it was starting the death knell of hand-drawn animation. And yeah. <laughs> Pixar Pixar has changed the game going forward, but just being blown away by what we saw on the screen by Toy Story. And it was a phenomenal film with Tom Hanks and Tim Allen and just so heartfelt. And it was, to me, it felt like one of those first animated films that we've kind of gotten a style of of where we've got a movie that kids can watch and enjoy but there's things in it for adults as well and yeah and and you had yeah and it was a great story as well it was well written and this was where you were getting like a plus stars to do voices and this was the attraction the main attraction for a lot of these films maybe the story wasn't that great or maybe the animation was that great but you 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 would market the film with a plus stars going forward and this movie was also projected that as well and kind of started that um trend but the other thing too is that all of the uh the cartoon TV shows that started coming out after this that were now computer animated. Some of them were a little herky jerky at first, but things started to become better. The, the uh, technology started becoming better, but yeah, toy story really kind of uh, revolutionized that. And uh, um, you know, then eventually one of my favorite, most beautiful uh, Pixar films, the, the first Incredibles film. Yeah, absolutely. Kevin, Number four on your list. This was the movie that I wanted to make sure we referenced another movie when we talked about this. Film. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, this one probably could have been a little bit higher on my list, but John Wick uh, for revolutionary action sequences and getting the lead actor Keanu Reeves to do a majority of his own stunts. And uh, uh, it just, it really cha- It was a game changer when it comes to action and being uh, directed by a former stunt stunt uh, um, guy who stunted for uh, um, uh, Keanu on the matrix films that, that being Chad still uh, I could go on and on about John wick, but I'm sure a lot of people would agree. This should be on the list for obvious reasons. And Kyle, you uh, mentioned uh, there's another film uh, you wanted to tag along with as well. Yeah. Jo- I agree with everything you said about John wick, but there's one thing a lot of people talk about with John wick. Oh, it was the creator of gun gun foo. Yes. And I got to put yes. hit the pause on that because there was a movie that came out with Christian Bale that really was the creator of gun Fu, And that is a movie called equilibrium. Now I do believe John wick perfected gun Fu, but you can't, you don't have John wick if you don't have equilibrium. And I, there was a lot. Make- uh, yes. But also you could also say that equilibrium was on the coattails of the matrix as well. Is there is some matrixy type stuff in there as well, but uh, when it comes to gun fu, yes, I will give it to uh, uh, Equilibrium first. But it, Matrix, like you said, definitely perfected it. <laughs> yeah, w- w- without question. So that brings me up us up to my number three, Kevin, and you have it on number three on your list as well, Avatar. And over the years, people have found ways to try to knock Avatar down pegs. They they turned on it, but I am sorry when Avatar first came out. That was all people were talking about. And people were walking out of IMAX 3D showings speechless by what they saw with the visual. Alone. Yes, maybe Avatar story is very is a basic and not the world's most creative story. But what James Cameron James Cameron is a movie game changer. And he did it again with Avatar because he 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 made IMAX important. He brought back 3D. And Avatar it to this day on whatever 3D movie 
TV I watch on is still one of the most beautiful three dimensional films I've ever seen. You say one of the most to me, it's still the best. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I remember, I remember the, the 3d glasses were like the biggest 3d glasses. And then it, it launched that 3d craze that we had for about, cause that came out in 2009. I would say the 3d craze started to kind of phase out maybe what 2016, maybe 16, 17. 17. Yeah. yeah. Boy, was it a craze and it was a way for theaters to charge extra on their ticket. And I know because I was one of those people that 3d didn't bother me. I know a lot of people, the 3d bothered them, so they didn't do it. But the, uh, the effect that, avatar did when it came to 3d was just the most mind-blowing thing i had ever seen and nothing has come close to it there's been a few good movies that hit 3d that were good but then they just started releasing everything in 3d and i was one of those guys that would go to 3d versions of films and i would see the 3d version instead of the 2d version because i wanted to see if it translated well and in my movie reviews i would mention hey this movie was good but it wasn't worth the extra 3d uh it was just you know and some of them were just obviously cash grabs you know but there were some that stand out like um dread in 3d was great one of the good movies to translate well to 3d and there were several other ones as well but Pacific i have not Graham stood out Yes, Pacific Rim. That was a good one. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, story wise, didn't bother me. I still enjoy this film. I'm a um, Avatar apologist and uh, I, I really enjoy I even enjoy this. The uh, special edition, uh, the little bit longer version as well. But this movie. Wow. Still wows me for the 3D. Yeah, I, I won't lie. At least once a year, I pull out my 3D Blu-ray and I still have a 3D TV and I'll watch Avatar just yeah. because I want to be mind blown. Yeah, but. Number two on our list, again, Kevin and I both agreed on this, and we want to make sure we hit it. Star Wars, New Hope, Episode 4. Practical effects just yeah. blown out the window. Every Music, sound mixing. So many things that were done, Kevin, and, and Star by George Lucas and Star Wars that changed movies. Yeah, this this was probably would have been my number one, but uh, number one and number two are interchangeable for me. And, you know, uh, we, we don't need to go on and on about Star Wars, but uh, the things that it did change was um, bringing back the orchestral music score and how important it was to translate the feeling of certain moments and scenes with the magnificence and genius that is John Williams. The practical effects and how they were done on a fly and how they were um producing and making new ways on this film on how to do them the location shots um just you know the story in itself the the, the story of the hero everything this thing has been copied so many times and we, there's so many films that we wouldn't have got if it wasn't for star wars and that's where johnny k made the great comment about not since star wars blah 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 and, and this, you know, this was influenced by Star Wars and all the funny copycats that came out after it. It, it. But the other thing, too, Kyle, the most obvious, the fandom that it produced and what we are talking about earlier in this episode with the Book of Boba Fett. I don't think there's anything that can compare or exceed the fandom of any movie that came out. There's, we could talk Star Trek. Star Trek came out first. We could argue what's bigger, Star Wars or Star Trek, and some other fandoms that came out after it. But Star Wars was what brought it back into it. And you can thank Star Wars. Actually, you can thank Star Trek for inspiring Star, Star, Star Wars. But you can thank Star Wars for keeping Star Trek alive, if you think about it. You know, uh, Star Wars comes out and they go, oh, let's go ahead and do Star Trek, um, the motion picture. So they can kind of thank each other, but it's Star Wars that really kind of pushed that fandom forward and the cultural impact that it has had on pop culture. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you just said. I think the only fandom I can even think of coming close to Star Wars fandom is MCU fandom at this point. And I, but other than that, Star Wars is just, it changed everything just yeah. at, the, at the end of the day. Um, number one, Kevin and I have two different films, but they're both so important. We wanted to make sure they both got recognized. Number one for me, to me, is a movie that changed um, special effects forever. Uh, Jurassic Park. Because yeah. not only did it change effects, it was very much marketed like Batman 89. I remember the 
build up of the poster. First, it was just the outline. Then they yeah. would put in another piece, and then another piece until the fourth. And there was the big midnight premiere for it too. You know, yeah. yeah. And when I don't care who you are, the first time you get that first shot of the dinosaurs on your screen, you you think they're real. You're like, and you get and you get John Wh- and you get the John Williams score backing it up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just that moment. And to this day, the effects of the original Jurassic Park hold up so well. Yeah, they do. And, I mean, everybody is talking about this film. And you you still see today on different things, people referencing this film as about how this got them into special effects or how it changed how they looked at movies. I mean, Jurassic Park just was one of those movies that the the market left on filmmaking will never be erased. The thing that uh, is not touched on a lot is that it's also a good story. The fact that these dinosaurs and how they came about with the, uh, the Amber and, and, you know, how they got like the DNA and, you know, uh, with a great story from Michael Crichton's book. Uh, that also was another thing that, cause if it, if it, it makes it believable, even though it's tough, even though technically no, but it's, it's believable. Actually it could be done nowadays you know when you think about it It, and and that's what also made that movie even more um uh you know amazing was that this is something that could might be able to possibly happen you know so yeah so kevin shall we get to your number one and if 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 any listeners out there haven't figured that what his number one probably is by now you haven't listened you're new to the podcast let's just put it that way (laughs) yeah yeah raiders raiders of lost ark um for for a, a few reasons it's it's about the spectacle of adventure and the everyday man um having an adventure and not being a superhero and um you know a, a lot of people like to bring up the new argument about how everything would have happened in raise the lost ark uh if indiana jones wasn't involved but they're missing the point the point is it's not about how Indiana Jones could have changed or not changed things. It's about the adventure from point A to point B and going through that. Or you can say it's about the mileage, you know, and the character building, but more importantly, how this movie is edited and put together with also the John Williams score um, about how there's a mapping that's done. And people, people often go through um, film school and I've done my research on this. This is considered a perfect film or a possible near perfect film for many, many reasons. And that is the pacing of this film is that every 10 minutes, something is happening. That's why you don't feel any like downtime in this film or where it gets boring. You're, you're leading into one thing and then you're leading into another. And it's this perfect puzzle that's placed in front of you and you're following it along. And like I said, it's not whether or not Indiana Jones has an effect on, you know, where the Nazis would end up and getting killed in this, but it's how you get there, how you get from point A to point B, which is, is fascinating. And the character involvement in this and the character development. Uh, and like I said, most importantly though, the fun adventure of a film and wanting to be part of it. This, I saw star Wars first and I enjoyed it for as much as it was and loved it. But Indiana Jones was the first hero to me that I wanted to be more than any movie I saw, more more than any TV series, I wanted to be Indiana Jones. And I think a lot of people felt that exact same way after seeing this for the first time. I think Indiana Jones also brought back a movie genre that had not really been around for a while. You know, we had the Star Wars space adventure and things like that, but we didn't have that kind of on-Earth adventure feeling for a good while. I think maybe even truthfully since maybe some Humphrey Bogart films and Harrison Ford brought that back. It made Harrison Ford a superstar. It made that movie, that kind of action movie, something that we, it just had that old classic Hollywood feel to it. And Kevin, I'm going to be honest with you. When I go back and think about it now, I can't think of too many films since those Indiana Jones films that have that same sense of feeling to that, to that. The closest one that I think that really kind of touched on that for me was the first Mummy movie with uh, Brendan Fraser. Yeah, I, I that had that, that feel. There was a lot of copycats and Alan Quartermains and a bunch of those, but that that adventure on Earth, 
where you feel like that you could actually go there. I would have to say that in um, a little bit with Stargate. Or, I'm sorry, with uh, Fifth Element and Stargate as well. Uh, but it was the mummy movie for me uh, with Brendan Fraser that really kind of had that Indiana Jones feel. And it's a certain feel that you don't get a lot when you go to films. Indiana Jones brings that feel to me. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you on that. So those are our magic eight ball picks. Kevin, is the magic eight ball appeased? The magic eight ball is appeased and is very happy. So we've done a good job. I want to do a special extra thanks again to all of our friends on social media that chimed in on the Facebook post. Wonderful comments. Very much appreciate you guys very, very much. Yeah, you guys are also help make what the show what it is, as well as all the other shows on the Phantom Podcast Network. Which, speaking of which, there's a lot of great places you can find Culture Clash and all the shows on the Phantom Podcast Network. But it all starts on our master feed at fpnet.podbean.com, where you can find the audio podcast of all the great shows on the Phantom Podcast Network. You can also use the Podbean app on your mobile devices. Of course, too, we are on so many other major podcast catchers, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podbean, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Visit our Facebook page, Fandom Podcast Network. If you want to give us some comments, you can always email us directly too at fandompodcastnetwork at gmail.com. You can follow us on Instagram, Fandom Podcast Network, or on Twitter at Fanpod Network. Kevin, where can people find you on social media? You can find me on uh, Twitter and Instagram at Spartan underscore Phoenix. Of course, you can find me on Facebook as well. And, uh, you know, any of our. Uh, I guess you could say our fandom podcast network um, Facebook groups. You know, we got the Blood of Kings for Highlander fans. We got the uh, uh, Union Federation for Star Trek and Orville. What a piece of junk for Star Wars. Uh, make sure you check us out. Yeah, it's so much good stuff. Of course, I'm Kyle. You can find me on Twitter at a Kyle W or on Instagram at a Kyle Fandom. Of course, there's a free great ways to support the Fandom Podcast Network because you can find now we're doing a lot more video. That's our goal for this year, 2022, the year the Fandom Podcast Network finally gets their YouTube right. <laughs> um, <laughs> go to our YouTube channel, please like, subscribe, share, share. It helps us out, um, and we want to just you know put out positive fandom out there for everybody of course too if you're noticing the, the great shirt that i am wearing this came from our fandom podcast network t public store go to tpublic.com type in fandom podcast network or the name of any of your favorite podcasts here on the network and you'll be able to find the gear it's getting a little cold outside there's some winter storms coming through you might want to order up a sweatshirt that's all i'm saying it's just true by the way the my camera on your fpn shirt there it's kind of doing a little like um uh, glittery thing on it. It's pretty cool. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> of course, too, we love reviews because as always, we're striving to improve ourselves and give you the best podcasts and YouTube shows that we can. So leave us reviews, especially on Apple Podcasts or YouTube. We love five-star reviews as always, but you know what? All the reviews in general help us as we strive to make better podcasts to feed your ears. Kevin, it's been a long show. It's our first one of the new year, but you know what? We had a great topic to talk about. We had some great input from our Facebook friends and we had some fun streaming shows to talk about as well. So it's, it's a new year. I'm excited. Um, I hope, I hope you're ready to dive into 2022. Hopefully we got a little bit more non COVID preventing us getting entertainment. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to it. A uh, lot, lot of things I'm looking forward to, and uh, I'm excited about sharing it here on the Fandom Podcast Network, man. Yeah, and of course, as we get ready to close out this episode of Culture Clash, as we always say from the great prophets, be excellent to each other. And I want to just add in something for this new year as we start off, Kevin, because we talked about it a little bit earlier in the episode. Love your fandom. No matter what anybody says, what everybody tells you, you think what they think. Love your fandom. Don't be afraid to express your love for your fandom. And if there's something that about it you don't like, put it out there. But don't you don't need to just say, hey, this is what I didn't like about it. I hope they improve next time. There's no need to keep on a negative vibe. We've got enough of that in this world. Be constructive with your criticism. Be 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 open to ideas and let everybody en enjoy what they love because we're all different and we all love something differently and we all look at something differently. So, and finally, as always, as we say around here. Respect each other and truly enjoy your fandom. And with that, it is time once again to close out the culture clash. Well, said. thank you, everybody. <laughs>